Reba McIntyre's life is the saga of a cowgirl who galloped out of Oklahoma to become a queen of country music. How am I doing? Well, sometimes it's hard to tell. She sings like an angel. I think what makes her, her stuff special is you believe it. She was not afraid to reach out and try to be successful. She's so hardworking. In the next hour, we will go back to Reba's early life on a cattle ranch in Chucky, Oklahoma, where toughness was a daily requirement. We get hot and sweaty, and a couple of them usually get into a fight. Reba's hard work and determination to become a star came at a price, including her first marriage. Well, I just kind of felt like I got my foot in the door and I was ready to continue on. And I, I don't know, just things kind of deteriorated. But as Reba's career blossomed, so did true love for the longtime band member and manager. Then in 89, he got demoted. I married him. <laughs> for a while, the music stopped when tragedy struck. Everyone on board died. The pilot, co-pilot, McIntyre's tour director, and seven band members. It was a disaster that no one ever dreams of happening. Yet it happened in the blink of an eye. She probably wakes up every day with that loss, but she's a survivor. Reba's story will be told by her family and friends, <laughs> including Barbara Mandrell, Dolly Parton, Vince Gill, Kenny Rogers, Tricia Yearwood, and former President George Bush. Reba never forgot her roots. When she's entertaining, she's talking to those people from Oklahoma or Texas or wherever. As well as Reba herself, we will follow Reba's life and career with rare family photos, behind-the-scenes concert footage, and moments from her most memorable movies. Cut him loose or you're next! This is the story of a cowgirl, singer, family woman, actress, entrepreneur, and survivor. This is Reba McIntyre, Celebrity Profile. Reba McIntyre was born in McAllister, Oklahoma, on March 28, 1955, the third of four children. Her mother, Jacqueline Smith McIntyre, was a teacher, and her father, Clark Vincent McIntyre, was a rancher and three-time world champion steer roper. Well, I grew up under the rodeo era, you know, knowing that's all I knew was rodeoing. It was a lot of fun growing up in Chalky, Oklahoma as a kid. We were all raised as third generation rodeo brats. So life on the McIntyre Ranch was full of mischievous fun with us kids until Daddy showed up, then he put us to work. I could take them kids and we could brand a hundred yearlings just quick as they could with men, you know. They just, they knew what to do and they'd punch them in. And... <laughs> but it wasn't long till they got to singing and I lost all my ranch hands. Mama was always cutting up with us kids, but she had her hands full. It's hard for me to imagine how she raised four kids with a ringer washing machine and a clothesline, no microwave, and no none of the uh, conveniences that we have today. Raised in the small town of Chalky, Oklahoma, Reba spent many days on the road, traveling by car with her family to her father's rodeo appearances. Reba's been referred to as the little old country hillbilly girl, you know. Well, she had been in 30 states when I was rodeoing before she ever started school. <laughs> Reba's mother, Jackie, once dreamed of a singing career of her own. And during long road trips, she taught the young McIntyres to harmonize. Music was pretty much always there because when we went rodeoing with Daddy, we didn't have a radio in the car, and so we would pass the time by singing in the back seat. Reba's older sister, Alice, remembers those early days of singing. You'd have four little kids sitting in the back seat and Mom and Daddy sitting in the front. While he was trying to concentrate, they were just doing everything, you know. Ordinarily, they'd be somebody that would get on somebody else's nerves and or that we'd be talking too loud or laughing too loud. He'd put his, he'd drive with this hand, he'd put his hand up on the seat. And then when they got so loud, he would start reaching and pinching. 
Didn't matter which one, just so I could get one of them, boy. <laughs> we quit doing that real quick. You know, legs went that away, and try to miss that hand that was going to pinch us if we didn't straighten up. You know, that gets pretty nerve-wracking after a couple of thousand miles going down the road. And uh, so Mama would um, get us to singing, and she taught us harmony. And we started singing songs like, Please, Mr. Custer, I Don't Want to Go, and Wake Up, Little Susie. And our little sister was named Susie, so we had a lot of fun singing that song for her. When Reba was five, her seven-year-old brother, Pake, introduced her to the professional side of music. We were in Cheyenne, Wyoming at the Frontier Hotel, and back then we didn't have televisions and telephones in our rooms, so all the cowboys and their wives and family congregated down in the lobby of the hotel, and they'd get to telling stories and visiting. And, and so one of the cowboys got Pake to get up and sing a song. Pake sang, You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog. And a cowboy gave him a quarter. So I saw what was going on, and I said, well, Pake, come here. Got him over to the side, and I said, um, help me think up a song to sing. So I got back out there, and I sang, Jesus Loves Me. I got a nickel. Go figure that one out. By the time she was in junior high school, Reba was performing regularly with her brother, Pake, and younger sister, Susie, as the Singing McIntyres. Reba's former basketball coach, Paul Davis, remembers her amazing determination. She did not want to get beat doing anything. And my opinion is that's why she's where she's at now. And if they were having a contest, I don't care what it was, she was up there doing her best to win it. And all of her brothers and sisters were doing the same thing. They entered. The McIntyres was really, really competitive because they grew up in that rodeo world or you had to be competitive if you wanted to win. A fine athlete, Reba began riding in rodeo barrel races at the age of 11. I always wanted to rodeo because when we would go to the rodeos with Daddy, the barrel racing was the ladies' event. And I was so in awe of the ladies and their flashy costumes and, and running barrels, and it was so, it was sort of romantic. At Kiowa High School, she was a guard on the women's basketball team. But it was clear that music remained Reba's passion when she founded the school's cowboy band. After graduating from high school in 1973, Reba used the money she made competing at rodeos and tending cattle to help pay for her education at Southeastern Oklahoma State University in Durant, Oklahoma. Her future was still undecided. Would she follow in the footsteps of her grandfather and father into the world of rodeo? Or would she teach school like her grandmother and mother before her? When we return, Reba makes her break from the singing McIntyres. He said, I don't think I could take all three, but I'll take Reba. And later. This is from me and Mama. Reba McIntyre's humble beginnings as a rodeo rider's daughter in Chalky, Oklahoma made her tough enough to go after what she wanted. But by 1974, she still hadn't decided whether to be a teacher or a rodeo performer. So Reba studied elementary education and music at Oklahoma State University while competing in as many as 50 rodeos a year. When I was a sophomore in college, Daddy knew I was going to be going to the National Finals Rodeo in Oklahoma City. And I said, well, Reba, get you a job up there and help pay your way. And I said, well, Daddy, what do you think I could do? He said, well, why don't you try to get a job singing the National Anthem? And I said, well, that's a good idea. It turned out to be a great idea. Her performance of the Star Spangled Banner caught the attention of country music songwriter and performer Red Stiegel. First time I saw Reba was in 1974 at the National Finals. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early as I was walking through the arena, I heard her singing the National Anthem, and, and at that time, it gave me cold chills. I'm walking down the hallway at the Hilton Hotel in Oklahoma City, and her mother grabbed me by the arm and asked if she could bring her daughter up to the Justin Suite. One of the cowboys wanted me to sing Joshua, the Dolly Parton song. So I sang it. I thought she had one of the greatest voices I'd ever heard, still do. And so after a while, Mama got around and asked Red if there was anything that he could do for all three of us kids to get in the music business. And he said, well, Jackie, honesty, honestly, I'm really 
doing all I can to get in the business myself. I'm, I'm having a hard time. I'm struggling. But Stiegel didn't forget about the little girl with the big voice. In January of 75, Red called Mama at home, and he said, Jackie, I've been thinking about this deal you proposed to me. He said, I don't think I could take all three, but I'll take Reba. What Red and I figured was that we could get Reba in the door and then maybe get the others later. So Mama sat all three of us down and told them what the deal was, and Paik was rodeoing and uh, very heavy into that, and he said, let Reba go on. Good luck. And Susie was still in high school, and she said, yeah, go for it. I knew that Reba had something special. I grew up wishing that I could do something like that. So at the age of 19, Reba departed from the singing McIntyres and headed to the capital of country music as a solo artist. But success did not come overnight. Mom and I went down to Nashville, cut a demonstration tape, and it was a couple of songs that Red and uh, some other folks had written. And so we went on back home. Red said, don't call me, I'll call you, pretty much. Back in Oklahoma, it was almost a year later when a record label executive changed her life. Polygram Mercury said, you can sign up one girl singer this year. And he looked at the two tapes and he handed them mine. And I've asked him since, I said, Glenn, who was the other girl? He said, I don't know, I don't remember. I just wonder where she is today and what happened to her. Reba's career and love life seemed to take off at the same time. While still rodeoing, she met a handsome cowboy who she first thought would be a good match for her sister. Reminded me a lot of Daddy, and, uh, but I always wanted him and Alice to get together. And Alice said, well, Reba, he's married. I said, oh, didn't know that, so okay. But then when we were rodeoing uh, that year in 74, uh, Charlie just won my heart. I fell in love with him and um, watching him. And then uh, after Fort Smith Rodeo, Pate came back and said that Charlie had divorced his wife. He separated and was getting divorced. And after that, me and Charlie got together. On June 21st, 1976, Reba married Charlie Battles. They spent their honeymoon promoting her first single. Older sister Alice remembers when the family heard Reba's song on the radio for the first time. They were just standing in the hallway and they just all just went to their, went down and sat on the floor just crying because it was such a special time for them. Reba's records were getting airplay. And in September 1977, she was booked to perform at the Grand Ole Opry for the first time. Unfortunately, the security guard didn't recognize the 22-year-old newcomer. We drove up to the back gate, and the guard said, yes, can I help you? And Clark said, we have Reba McIntyre, and she is going to be on the opera tonight. He went down through his list, and he said, not tonight, she's not. Clark said, what should we do? He said, well, I would advise you to turn around right down here and head back to Oklahoma. So. We went to this convenience store, and Reba called her booking agent. And he said, you drive back down to that gate, and by the time you get there, that man will be motioning you in. Reba also had to endure the day-to-day -day difficulties of a country rookie. It was not a fun time of singing in honky-tonks and clubs, and they were really smoky, and my eyes were burning so bad from the smoke that it burned so bad when I closed it. I mean, my sinuses were killing me, and I called the booking agent the next day, and I called Charlie, and I said, Charlie, tell them not to book me anywhere in a club anymore. He said, well, you'll probably never work another day in your life. And I said, well, if I don't get another job, that's fine with me. I knew I had to get better. It couldn't get any worse. And things did get better. Soon, she opened for such acts as Conway Twitty and the Statler Brothers. She also got the attention of country's best. Every time she'd mention my name, she said she used to listen to my records when she was, you know, growing up when she was back home in Oklahoma, and that, you know, she just liked me a lot, and that just, I mean, like, after she was already a big star and everybody was, like, making so over her, I thought, well, what a nice compliment to think that I've, you know, had some kind of an influence. I consider it a, a real privilege and a real um, honor to be able to tell people, yeah, she's my girlfriend. And then, with a spot on national television, Reba felt she had finally made it. 1981, I sang on the Johnny Carson show. And to our families, 
well, we're in Hollywood. That's it. You know, you'll never get any bigger than that. When we return, Reba makes a life-changing decision. I said, Mama, you, uh, you busy this afternoon? And she said, why? And later, Reba faces her most difficult hour. It was a disaster that no one ever dreams of happening. In 1984, at the age of 29, Reba McIntyre decided to explore new options. She left behind a seven-year relationship with Mercury Records and joined MCA, where she changed her image, her music, and, for the first time, even picked her own songs. A song for me is things that people can relate to, something that touches my heart, because if it touches my heart, it comes out my mouth, and it touches the person that listens, and they feel the same thing I did, if I deliver it well. Reba's colleagues admired her determination. We can all look up to her for saying, this is how, this is how you do things, and be in control of your own career, because as much as other people around you may care, you care about your career more than anybody, and you need to make those decisions. She's got a great knack for great songs and, and, and finding them and knowing what they are. Reba's first two albums on the MCA label, Just a Little Love and My Kind of Country, eclipsed the sales of her previous records. She also captured the first of four consecutive awards as Female Vocalist of the Year from CMA, the Country Music Association. First time me and Mama came to Nashville, she told me, she said, Reba, I couldn't do this, so I'm living my life and my dreams through you. This is from me and Mama, and we thank you. That was the start of a long run for her. Uh, winning those awards, but that's the first major one I think that she had won. And it was very, very exciting. I was numb. In 1986, Reba was inducted as a member of the Grand Ole Opry. The 1986 Entertainer of the Year is Reba McIntyre. Named the CMA Entertainer of the Year. I'm not going to cry, I'm going to faint and received her first Grammy for the song, Whoever's in New England. When whoever's in New England's through with you And Boston finds better things to do You know it's not too late Cause you'll always have a place to come back to Whoever's in New England, the saga of a neglected wife, seemed to touch a nerve in an audience that had suddenly become mainstream. I think it's an extremely well-written song. It was extremely well-produced, and it was a song that created a, a whole new career for her. She sings with a lot of heart, a lot of emotion, a lot of soul. It's like a great actress. You know, when they make that great delivery, you believe it. Reba's fame soon spread beyond America's Southwest and eventually earned the entertainer her first gold record. Mom and Daddy always said, if you're going to do something, be the best at what you can do. Uh, you know, don't just give half of your talent, half of your work. If you're going to do something, go do it. Mom and Daddy were always there for us. And um, I think that, uh, that just spills over to our work ethics. In her climb to the top, Reba had gained the support of family and fan alike. But this success took its toll on her personal life. Well, what changed between Charlie and myself, when we got married, I was 21 and he was 31. He was 10 years and 18 days older than me. And I was a little young, naive, red-headed, freckle-faced kid from Oklahoma. And he had already won three world championships in the IRA, rodeoing. When we got married, it was just so much fun. and. Had a great time, and then I started growing up, and I started wanting more things, like a career a little more important uh, to me. And he was ready for me to settle down after I won Female Vocalist of the Year. Well, I just kind of felt like I got my foot in the door, and I was ready to continue on. And I, I don't know, just things kind of deteriorated. Reba's marriage with Charlie Battles was not working, and she decided to do something about it in the midst of another family crisis. Daddy was having triple bypass heart surgery in Tulsa. And so I went up, visited them, and, and uh, Charlie went back to the house. 
And I looked over at Mom and I said, Mama, you, uh, you busy this afternoon? And she said, why? I said, well, I found a lawyer. I'm going to go file for divorce. And Daddy said, well, what took you so long? Coming up, Reba struggles to put her life back together. And she had some hard times. And later, Reba discovers a different love. He is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. By 1988, Reba McIntyre had successfully become a crossover artist at the age of 33. She also decided to take control of her own career, calling on bandmate Marvel Blackstock to act as her manager and assist in the formation of Starstruck Entertainment. At the time, it was Reba's business. But we wanted to call it, Norma wanted to call it something other than Reba's business, but in, just in case we got any more acts. We love Moonstruck. What, what are we in this business for? We're, we're struck about some. Okay, we're starstruck. Located on Nashville's historic Music Row, Starstruck Entertainment, a publishing and management firm, took Reba from musician to entrepreneur. She's very commercial-minded. I think she knows how to merchandise her, herself in a proper way without prostituting herself. There's a fine line between knowing how to promote yourself wisely. I think Norval's been a great asset to her. He's kept her grounded and focused, and that she, on the other hand, has made a lot of good business decisions with Norval that's uh, put her in a position to kind of pick and choose. I think she knows who she is. She knows her weaknesses. She knows her strengths, and she knows how to, you know, truly play off, off the strengths. And as Starstruck Entertainment grew, so too did the personal relationship of Reba and Narva. So 1988, I, I appointed the job of being my manager to Narva. And then in 89, he got demoted, I married him. <laughs> the ceremony took place on June 3rd, 1989 in Lake Tahoe. It's just been a wonderful partnership and uh, I absolutely love being married to him, working with him. He aggravates the fire out of me sometimes, but I don't think I could live with anybody else. We're as different as night and day, totally in every aspect, except in the fact that when we both like the same thing, it's magical. And as that magic took hold, Reba took new risks. She even changed her look with the help of stylist Sandy Speaker. Reba's style was a lot of jeans with her big signature belt buckle, a lot of dresses, sort of in the denim mode, a lot of boots, and that was her. That was, that was her look for a while. And slowly we, we changed that and modified that and eased her into a more contemporary look. In 1990, after Reba had achieved enormous success in the music industry, she made her screen debut as a survivalist in the comic science fiction horror movie, Tremors. You didn't get penetration even with the elephant gun. Good Lord. That was my first movie. And I thought, I don't like this. <laughs> Lord, it was hard work. And I, I'm not really good at memorizing lines. I can memorize them if they're melodic or if they rhyme. But the words didn't make sense to me. And when I read them, and when I, then when I said them, they, I would rearrange them. Reba was now active in film, in recording, and on the road. And amid all this, at age 34, Reba took on her proudest project. She gave birth to a son, Shelby Blackstock, on February 23rd, 1990. I never will forget how she looked when that baby came. She was, uh, she was ecstatic. And uh, she told me, said, you were right, as always. You, you told me that I, I had never lived until I'd had a child. And now I'm living. Shelby Doon, <laughs> Shelby Don. Shelby Don is the sunshine of my life. He is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I say Narvel's the greatest thing because Narvel and I got married when we had Shelby, so both are the greatest things. And I thank God every day for both of them. Within weeks of giving birth to Shelby, Reba was back in the studio recording her 18th album, Rumor Has It, which became her first double platinum effort. But in 1991, the music stopped. The corporate jet hit the mountain hard, cutting a swath through the terrain, leaving debris trailing behind. Following a performance in San Diego, seven members of Reba's band, her road manager, and two pilots 
perished in a plane crash. Reba was scheduled to be aboard, but stayed behind due to bronchitis. It was March 16, 1991. We were in San Diego, and after the show, two small planes were going to take the band and crew on up to Fort Wayne, Indiana, where we were going to do a show the next night. And one of the small planes never left California. And we had been touring together um, that whole period of time, and they were my friends that perished in that plane crash as well. I knew one of the one of her band members, and um, I I remember I know how I felt, and that was I lost one person. She lost seven or eight people, so I can't imagine what she what she went through. And I know that she probably wakes up every day with that loss, but she's a survivor. We were so shocked. You know, it, it was it was a disaster that no one ever dreams of happening, yet it happened in the blink of an eye. And how we regrouped was by the grace of God, by the strength of God, by the family, everybody sticking together. When we return, a tough decision at a trying time. People will think I'm heartless by going back and doing this. Behind in March of 1991, most of Reba McIntyre's band and her road manager were killed in a plane crash. Weeks earlier, Reba had been invited to perform at the Academy Awards. Now, just two weeks after the tragedy, Reba searched for the right thing to do. I was going to sing, I'm checking out of this heartbreak hotel. And I sat there and I thought, how, how am I going to do that? People will think I'm heartless by going back and doing this. And all of a sudden, a feeling came over me like, yes, go do it. Go do it for us. And I was like, what? And, it, and then this feeling just said, go do it. We want you to go do it. And a thousand pounds went off my shoulders. And it was just like, yeah, well, of course. They were checking out of this heartbreak hotel. They're in a lot better place now. She felt like the band would have wanted her to go on. Probably, I guess she may have looked at it like if she had been the one in the crash, they would have gone on with their lives. They wouldn't have stopped. And that, that she needed to go on too. I never blamed God for the incident, for the accident. I, I never was mad. I've always believed things happen for a reason. And why those beautiful, talented people were taken from this earth, I'll never know until I get up there and ask him. That's going to be one of my main questions. But. Um, it all happened for a reason. It was still a traumatic experience. And the plane crash with the band was a burden that very few people could have survived. But again, that pioneering spirit and that real strong character that's born and bred in her uh, came to the forefront. It was that inner strength. It was that knowing you're supposed to do something. And, and I had all the backing in the world from them, from God, my family, and, and the fans. Some understood, some didn't. But most did. Reba immersed herself in her work as a way to ease her grief. This time, in front of the camera. The gambler with Kenny Rogers came and saved my mind. That was right after the plane crash in 91. And we were still trying to get things put back together. And uh, Ken Cragen, Kenny's manager, called Narville and said, would Reba like to do uh, the gambler with Kenny Rogers? And Narville came home and I said, Thank you, Jesus, man. This is gonna, this is gonna do it. And it got me busy. It got my mind off of losing my friends. So it was a chance for her to pay, to have something she could put her attention to, focus on. That was relatively new for her acting. She could literally go into denial for a while, and yet have an artistic outlet. It saved my sanity. I mean, everybody had to do something to get back on track. And that was, that's what did it for me. And working with Kenny was great. We had a wonderful time. Also in 1991, Reba went back into the studio to record her most healing and emotional album, For My Broken Heart. It sold two million copies. And at that year's CMA Awards, Reba performed the album's title track. Stop from 
During this same telecast, Reba began a friendship with some very special guests. And I'm very proud to welcome two country music fans who are very special guests here in the Grand Ole Opry House tonight, the President of the United States and Mrs. George Bush. In that marvelous setting uh, where she's so well known and so her fame uh, really came to life, uh, I just felt a joy in being a part of it. In the years that followed, Reba continued to build her acting career. In 1994, she co-starred with Keith Carradine in the television movie, Is There Life Out There? Based on her song of the same name. You know, I recorded that song thinking my cousin could relate to this. <laughs> Trisha Ann Hamilton in Kyle, Oklahoma. Little did I know millions of people all over the country could be relating to the song, Is There Life Out There? Well, Hollywood loved it, and they wanted to do a movie on it. And so we filmed it in Nashville, had a wonderful time with it. And it was the first movie I got to be the leading lady in. You're not hearing me. If I had to choose, it would be you and the kids. You know that. But I have this chance to... Remember when I asked you, is there life out there? Well, I don't have to ask anymore because I know there is and I'm a part of it. In that same year, Reba co-starred in a comedy for Rob Reiner. North was a lot of fun getting to work with Dan Aykroyd and uh, Elijah Wood and Rob Reiner. It was, it was a great experience. It was um, an Oki playing a rich Texan. Didn't know how my folks would like that, but everybody seemed to be okay with it. In the meantime, Reba was adding to her store of double platinum albums with It's Your Call and Greatest Hits, Volume 2. Her 1994 collection, Read My Mind, contained the surprise hit, She Thinks His Name Was John. The song's popularity astounded the music industry because it dealt with a sensitive issue. The song's protagonist dies of AIDS. I thought it was a very well-written song that touched my heart, and it was a, a dedication song. It took a lot of courage to, to sing a song like that, and, and uh, uh, I admire her in many ways. And I wanted to sing it for all the folks out there who have AIDS or who, um, for young people, might, might make them think just a little bit more before they go out and be a little, a little, live a little dangerously. You know, things can happen one time after just one time, and you'll regret it for the rest of your life. In August 1994, the Country Music Association nominated Reba for awards in six categories a record for a female performer. Reba performed at the CMA Awards with Linda Davis, the duet, Does He Love You? The song also brought Reba her second Grammy. But it took a TV role in the 1995 miniseries, Buffalo Girls, to bring Reba face to face with a lifelong hero. I got to play Annie Oakley, and I've always been a huge fan of Annie Oakley. And then I get to play her, and it was so funny, I always wear little studs, little diamond studs. And on the movie, they were saying what Annie Oakley would wear. And Sandy Speaker, my stylist, was with me on the movie. And she said, well, I guess you want her to change your earrings. And said, no, believe it or not, Annie Oakley, that's the only earrings she ever wore. So it was real coincidental, very strange. Coming up, a health problem hits close to home. And Reba responds. Walking around and seeing the families be with their children. Before Reba McIntyre had achieved mainstream success. Uh, sir, I just need one thing. Sorry, we're closed. But this is Reba McIntyre. See? Yeah, right. Show him, Reba. The award-winning singer soon became a best-selling author with her autobiography, Reba, My Story. In her personal life, Reba continued to find happiness with husband Narvel, their son Shelby, as well as Narvel's children from his first marriage. You know, to have Sean and Chelsea and Brandon and Chastity, my, my stepchildren and step-granddaughter, that's wonderful. We all get along very well. I told Chastity the other day, I said, I guess it wasn't meant to be for me to have another child after Shelby. And she said, well, we're there for you. And Reba was there for a new generation of McIntyres who themselves aspired to be entertainers. 
including nieces Autumn and Garrett. She's my hero. She is definitely my hero. She always has been. I view her as somebody that I look up to and that's somebody I want to be like in the music business. She not only showed me that you can come from a small town with rural background and really not know that much about this huge world, but you can go out there and you can make it and you can also own it. She's just Aunt Reba. She's really cool. Another niece, Haley, also touched Reba's heart. She was born with mental and physical disabilities. Reba saw a need and created an answer in the Reba Ranch House. Reba said, Alice, what do you think about doing a, a, a place like the Ronald McDonald House to help the people of southeastern Oklahoma and uh, northeast Texas? And I said, Reba, I think it'd be great. And when we needed that help with Haley, people like Reba were there, people who cared, people who needed, who knew that we needed support and backup. And Reba's doing that for other families. Reba started by helping a family member and continued to use her celebrity to support others. The things that really make me feel the best about my career are the things like getting to sing What If for the Salvation Army and kick off their kettle drive. It's, it's when you can give back. Bob Hope told me years ago, he said the fun part about this business is when you can help others. And Reba has helped many. The Children's Medical Research Center in Oklahoma City, the hospital there, is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, like I said earlier, go walking around and seeing the families be with their children and them knowing sometimes it could be their last visit with them or their last month with them. And they still have a smile on their face to make their children's last days as comfortable and happy as possible. She's a good person, gives a lot to others, wonderful family person and friend, a loyal friend. Reba's life work was recognized in Ann Klein's 1998 fall advertising campaign entitled Significant Women. The campaign highlighted Reba's latest look. It shows her accomplishments uh, along with these other incredible women, which is the whole uh, big theme around this Ann Klein you know, campaign. And it also shows that she, you know, she can be as contemporary and sleek and sexy as, as all these other women. You know, she's a little bit of a chameleon. In her music video, If You See Him, Reba's new style sizzles to life. If you see him, tell him I wish him well. How am I doing? Well, sometimes it's hard to tell. Reba also continued to pursue her acting career and in 1998 co-starred in the CBS miniseries Forever Love with Tim Matheson. It was a real touching movie and it was it was great to work with her because she's so open and and real and vulnerable just like her singing. It was very heartbreaking for me to read this script because it's about a woman who when her child is two years old, she has a stroke, and 20 years later, she wakes up realizing she's missed 20 years of her daughter's life, 20 years with her husband who she loved and adored. I think that we should just take things slowly. This isn't our first date. Well, it kind of feels like that. You don't want to make love to me, do you? No, no, it's not, it's not that. It, what is it then? What? It, it's just... I'm afraid that I'm going to lose you again. And everybody would ask me, how are you going to prepare for this part? And I said, how would you feel to wake up and know that you missed the most beautiful, precious moments of your child's life? My heart ached for, for Lizzie the character I play, how would you deal with it? Every time you pass by a playground, that's what you miss. Coming up, Reba receives one of the highest honors of her career. This is the one that means the most to me. Putting on a boot. Reba McIntyre, 
The cowgirl from a rugged life in Oklahoma took that pioneering spirit to become a country music icon, actress, author, and philanthropist. There is no one more deserving of the Mini Pearl Award than this year's honoree, ladies and gentlemen, Reba McIntyre. <laughs> Reba was recognized for her humanitarian contributions on June 15, 1998, when she received the TNN Music City News Mini Pearl Award. Of all the awards I've received, of all the people who have said, Reba, you've done good, this is the one that means the most to me. By the late 1990s, Reba proved herself to be more than just a celebrity. I don't have a Reba on and a Reba off stage, or Reba the star and Reba the mom. I don't have that button to push. This is me all the time. Reba McIntyre is the ultimate American success story. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. Part of her success comes from the fact that she never got to be too big a deal in her own mind. She is a big deal in everybody else's mind, but she never lost touch with the people. She's a national treasure. She is one of those pioneering women that will have a big place in the history of country music. She gives more than that 110%. I mean, she goes to the moon. She kicks it. I think you get what you've put out there, and I think that she will absolutely get everything she deserves. You gain a richer and fuller life being around her. I'm so proud of her. I hope she'll always be happy. I'm a happy camper. <laughs> if they need to know anything about Reba, is Reba's a happy person. She loves what she does, and she is, uh, thinks she's the luckiest person in the world. <laughs>